thanks for having us here today. Um, so Desiree Carroll, uh, Senior uh, Manager at the AICPA, where I staff our Sustainability Assurance and Advisory Task Force and um, work with various of our sustainability-related efforts. Um, <clears throat> as you heard with us today, we have Kristen Sullivan, who is a partner at Deloitte, as well as John DeRose, who's an Executive Director at EY. Um, and I'm really just going to start off by asking them to share a little bit more about their respective roles at their firms. Um, Kristen, would you like to start? And then John, if you want to follow. Sure. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Desiree and Mary. I'm really thrilled to be here today and talking about assurance. I am a partner at Deloitte. I lead our sustainability and KPI services. And that really covers the breadth of the whole evolution of, of non-financial reporting that we're seeing in the market, all the way from how we help our clients think about these risks and, and opportunities, how that translates into governance data management and ultimately disclosure, and then assurance on that information as it becomes much more important to the marketplace and to companies in, in driving their strategies. And I also serve as the chair of the AICPA Sustainability Task Force, working closely with Desiree and John, and again, really excited for the conversation today. I'll pass it over to John. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, uh, nice to be here as well. I'm an executive director in our climate change and sustainability practice here at EY. Um, our practice handles everything from environmental health safety and sustainability to systems implementations to the area I'm responsible for that we'll focus on today is around non-financial reporting and assurance. Um, I have CPA by background, been working in the sustainability space probably for the past uh, 12 or 15 years. Great, thanks, Kristen and John. Um, you know, as Mary mentioned, please do just submit, continue to submit questions throughout and we'll, we'll monitor that and, and try to answer those as we go. <clears throat> um, so I'd like to just start off, John, I might first pose the first question to you. Um, so let's just talk about assurance in general first. So, you know, what is it we're referring to when we talk about assurance? And then and maybe you could add some commentary as to why companies choose to assure information. You know, particularly given that assurance of non-financial information is, is generally done on a, a voluntary basis. And then, Kristen, if you want to weigh in afterwards, please feel free to do so. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I'll take a step back even, and, and I'll kind of talk about how we've seen assurance mature uh, over the past you know, decade or so. Um, so assurance essentially is the process of having a third party who is independent of your organization come in and help look at your information, and in this case we say ESG or environmental, social, and governance or sustainability information, and look at it to give users of the information comfort over its accuracy and reliability. So the assurance provider often issues some sort of accountant's report, and we'll get into more detail on that later, I'm sure. Um, but companies are seeking assurance for many reasons. Like I said, maybe 10, 12 years ago, companies were looking for assurance um, to score better on uh, the carbon disclosure project or the DGSI. Um, and, you know, they just saw it as a piece of paper, check the box, let's get this thing going. In today's marketplace, less companies are interested in, in that aspect and they see the value in the depth of knowledge from accountants coming to actually provide the assurance and then providing recommendations around controls and processes, uh, reporting in accordance with criteria and all the stuff that happens that never really gets included in this public report, which stakeholders need um, in order to understand the accuracy and reliability of information. So companies have changed their mindset. They no longer view it as a check the box exercise and they're moving towards more of the value it creates internally and also the sophistication it gives to that internal and external reporting because the information is used in many different ways uh, than it had been you know, 10 or 12 years ago. So I'll pause there and, and see if Kristen has anything she wants to add. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a great overview. And the only thing I would add, and, and again, we might continue this theme, is just this proliferation that John mentioned in terms of the, uh, over the last decade or so, just the tremendous volume of the supply of information, this non-financial information that's being provided to the market, and a recognition, right, that, that companies, while they're looking for that external uh, validation or credit that, that they get in some cases from obtaining external assurance. I think there's a growing recognition that we're providing this information intentionally to meet the information needs of our critical stakeholders 
So we want to make sure as an organization, as a board, as executive management, that that information is, is credible and complete and reliable and can in, truly influence and inform uh, decision making and then therefore uh, effective disclosure of, of a more holistic view of performance of the company. And I think there's a recognition that assurance is really an important tool to help sort of reinforce that governance structure and help drive continuous improvement in, in how a company is managing risks and, and taking advantage of opportunities. Thanks, Kristen and John. Um, <clears throat> perhaps maybe just to expand on, on that, Kristen, um, just do you want to provide a little bit more insight into what we're seeing in the US in terms of the current, I guess, reporting and assurance landscape, how you're seeing that as it relates to non-financial information? So, you know, in what forms is non-financial information sort of being presented and to what extent are companies seeking assurance of this information? So just some insight into the current landscape in the US. Sure, sure. And I think it's also important just to level set for this audience in terms of, you know, our focus and emphasis is, is on this defined universe of ESG. Under the broader integrated reporting umbrella, clearly ESG is critical. Um, and, and in a lot of cases for companies, it's a starting point, right, to instill that discipline to begin to draw the connectivity and interdependency of ESG issues with broader financial performance. Um, <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I've got a allergy taking over. So, um, I think I think many of us uh, and many likely many in the community on the line uh, see a lot of the stats. Right, we know now as of what last week that 86% of the S&P 500 now provide some form of sustainability reporting to the marketplace. But I think as is natural in the progression of of voluntary, you could argue, reporting, uh, assurance lags. And, and while we are seeing it increase, we've seen it increase dramatically around the world, and we are seeing it increase for a number of different reasons. John touched on a number of them in the U.S. But, you know, I think what we're seeing, even over the last, I would say, six to 12 months, where we're starting to see more companies uh, begin to integrate ESG into more streamlined, more mainstream uh, corporate reporting and and as a part of that evolution and that's driven in, in largely by a number of the standards that are now out there and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail and really a, a greater appreciation or determination by a company as to what are the outlets that will allow me to effectively communicate with my critical stakeholders as you begin to introduce this idea of uh, it's not just a standalone report on your website, or you might begin to introduce this information in your proxy statement, or you know that, that raters and rankers or investors are using this information. Um, those that are beginning to sort of be the, the trailblazers and include this information in their financial filings, that's where we've seen this interest and appetite really start to accelerate around assurance and, and what the value of assurance can be. I mean, I think we still see that, that assurance in, in this form will, will lag a little bit. And I think, you know, that's part of, I think, the conversation of leaders in terms of um, what we're reporting, how we're reporting it, through what avenue are we using to report it, and what are the considerations that, that we need to, 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 to evaluate as an organization um, in terms of moving towards obtaining assurance. And, and I think that's, that's where we're starting to see the acceleration. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Um... You know, if you think about the governance structure that Kristen mentioned, and we think about what companies are doing for managing their operations, um, and, you know, and aligns with this whole concept of integrated thinking. Um, you know, we see behind the scenes at many large companies of how the finance function is becoming more involved with the day-to-day -day activities of the sustainability function. And it's not just because they're looking over their shoulder and they're worried about what is actually being put out in public domain. That's one of the cases, but it's because the activities and the purpose of what's being done in sustainability is permeating throughout the organization and the information is relevant because it aligns with the various goals and objectives from a strategic perspective of that organization. So then in comes finance, right? Reporting through the controllership, SEC reporting uh, up to CFO. Um, in, you know, we, we could talk about it here and we will, and you may not see that yet in the stats as far as if you go out and try to dig up stats of where's assurance being done over what metrics, by whom, under what standards, but we know the conversations that are happening in, in, in place. And I can tell you that we will see a change in how this information is treated, 
how the governance structure of it is is um, mandated within an organization and who is involved with getting this information aggregated internally for internal decision making purposes, as well as how it's going to be presented and where it's going to be presented externally. And, and that shift is happening. And, you know, it doesn't happen overnight because it's a big deal, but we've seen, you know, and I think as Kristen alluded to in the past 12 to 18 months, a lot of shifts in the marketplace, you know, with SASB codifying their standards, with the TCFD out there with guidance, with a lot of the pressures from shareholder resolutions and some of them passing, some of them coming near, um, that, that this, this level of respect for the information and how it impacts an organization, how it impacts external stakeholder decision making has risen. So there's, you know, there's always a lag in trying to get your arms around it from a, you know, changing something to, to something that may be newer within the organization. But, you know, we're seeing that and we're helping clients through that at this point. So, you know, it's all, you know, the end of that conversation is, yeah, now this information is now out there in the marketplace. It's being treated with the respect of maybe financial information and it's, it's getting that kind of governance and oversight um, from the appropriate individuals within the organization, which is why assurance under professional standards is so important. Thanks, thanks, Kristen and John. You know, kind of, I guess, John, maybe following on from what you've just mentioned about uh, professional standards being so important, do you maybe want to share with folks sort of, you know, what, is it, what standards do you follow when you provide these services? when you provide assurance services, and maybe as part of that, you could kind of comment on <clears throat> any additional steps the CPA profession has kind of taken to help ensure that assurance practitioners are, you know, are ready to perform these types of assurance engagements over other non-financial information. Yeah, so that's a great question, and I think totally relevant, particularly, you know, to the folks, you know, who are working at corporations as well as to other CPAs on the line. Um, you know, there are professional standards under the CPA that allow us to provide assurance over various types of metrics that are just not financial metrics. Um, if you look to um, ATC 205 and 210, that'll, those are the standards for review and examination engagements, which allow us to do this work. The task force, which I'm a part of under the CPA, which Kristen leads, we wrote a guide that actually provides guidance on how a practitioner could go about providing assurance over this type of information. So the guide is very helpful to CPAs, but the guide is also helpful for corporations, particularly when you start to involve finance function. They are familiar with financial statement audits. So if you wanna know what to expect from assurance from a CPA um, over these non-financial metrics, you, know, you can look at that guide, which is available out on the ASCPA website. You can share it with your finance department, you can share it with internal audit, and you can start to understand the rigor behind the assurance process but also link that up to the controls and processes and the way you currently collect your data to understand where there may be gaps and where you may need to address um, uh, some, some data gaps or some controls and processes. But having those parties at, your, at the organization involved will make that job a lot simpler. And, and then the ACPA also, we, we've put out uh, frequently asked questions. There are some uh, courses for CPE. Um, so there are a host of uh, materials out there and available. I think we, we have a slide we'll maybe put up later with, with some of those links. Um, you know, I, and I think it's important to just realize that, you know, don't look at all of this and, and get down on yourself because there is rigor being placed behind it, right? You know, we think about the finance function and we think about accounting for regular finance metrics, cash, APAR, whatever. That's taken a while to evolve. So, what's in hand now and the standards and frameworks that are available will allow us to get there. Um, but we know it's an iterative process and we know companies are moving along the path and, and many of them at different levels of maturity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe I just add to that. Thank you, John, in terms of just the role of the profession, again, getting back to this evolution in terms of the concept of integrated reporting and the journey that we know many companies are on and when we think about the AICPA's role and the, and the role of CPA firms, as John was mentioning, this idea that, you know, as a CPA, as the financial statement auditor for a company or, or otherwise, you know, we're bringing a lens to 
the, the, the practice of, of auditing and, and established uh, standards and, and, and processes and an understanding of how an organization, you know, across the business model is understanding risk, translating that into performance measures and ultimately providing information to the marketplace. And so that's so different in terms of what we're trying to educate the market around is we do that, that same, we're, we're, we're following that same process in this whole evolution of non-financial reporting and bringing that rigor and discipline and established practices, but recognizing that the subject matter is different. And, and to John's point, the guide that we published is intentionally trying to help sort of translate how do you apply attestation standards, audit standards um, to this subject matter and, and keeping that lens in mind towards this idea of integrated reporting. Again, we know there's a journey to get there, but um, ultimately many companies have that objective and, and wanting to make sure that, that the provi a provider can bring the perspective both to the financial statement audit as well as the, the non-financial assurance services is so critical. And, and look, you know, CPA firms who are involved in, in companies and, and helping to, to provide services to companies have a perspective of sort of what's presenting risk to the, to the company across the, the industry, the global footprint, exposures out there. You know, what, what drives value for an organization? What puts value at risk? And how can uh, that be translated through the, you know, by the organization into more effective disclosure that instills confidence with the user? And so I think we think as a, as a profession that, that we have an obligation, we have a public interest obligation to, to educate and, and provide awareness and, and through a lot of the tools that we are, that we are providing that have been mentioned and, and you'll have access to, it's a step in that direction to help as this whole process matures. And, and just to, to, to continue to reinforce that, that we know this is a, a maturity and, and, and it, you know, companies were starting to see the trends shift, but having the tools in place and, and importantly for the market participants to understand the role of assurance, what assurance means, and really the value that it provides both for a company, because I think we, in a lot of cases, look to, you know, the value that's, that's generated for the users of the information, but really the external users, I should say, of the information, but the value it can really drive for a company as, as they are investing and looking to drive value through ESG. Assurance is a critical tool for that. And, and I'll add, I guess, because you, you mentioned it a bit, Kristen, is, you know, under our professional standards, CPAs are not allowed to do work if we're not competent to do work. So an additional item that I know all the large CPA, CPA and mid-tier mid CPA firms are doing is we're actually, you know, training our folks to do this, but we're also hiring scientists, data scientists, engineers. So those people are now part of the teams because this is new subject matter. And the people are clients, they're smart, right? They're engineers and, and they know how to collect this information and they know what it means, to, you know, they know their business. Um, and we are, you know, we have, and it, this is all CPAs, have ramped up and are ramping up to meet those needs and, and to actually be able to deliver and talk like like with our clients about these issues as they're being reported and captured. So it's, um, it's a, there's a lot of um, rigor put behind the assurance process and the interpretation, the actual use of the professional accounting standards. Thanks, Kristen and John. You know, kind of as we were touching on the standards, maybe we'll just dive in a little bit more. So uh, could you tell folks, for folks that are, are not too familiar with assurance, we do have different levels of assurance that, you know, that folks can choose from. Could you sort of highlight what those are? What, what do companies have to choose from? And, and what are you seeing with regard to sort of demand for those different levels of assurance? You know, most companies seeking one level over another. And, and how is that evolving? How are you seeing that evolve? Well, I can, I can start. And, and I think it's a really important question in terms of as companies as preparers are evaluating <coughs> what assurance means, um, what value it will provide, and how to really determine what the scope of, of assurance is that will meet their objectives. I would just say at the outset, largely in the U.S., with the current state of, of sustainability assurance, that a review level, which is a limited level of assurance, which results in an assurance statement available publicly, uh, that, that includes a conclusion that, that nothing came to our attention. So uh, what's referred to commonly as negative assurance. So we performed a series of procedures to reduce risk or to minimize risk to a certain level, and nothing has come to our attention that suggests that this information is not presented in accordance with the, the criteria. 
that's, I think, generally the, the, the norm that, that we've been seeing for the past several years in the marketplace. It's meeting um, the objectives of companies across the both internal and external objectives. I think we are seeing a shift towards, so the second level of assurance is a reasonable level of assurance, an examination in our, in our attestation standards. That the sort of equates to an audit level of assurance. So it's a it's a conclusion. It's a positive uh, opinion that that the information is presented fairly in accordance with the, the criteria. We we are seeing a shift. We we have a, we have a client and a couple clients in particular who um, they are seeking an examination and a reasonable level of assurance very intentionally for their own internal purposes. They find more value when we dig in more and we perform more substantive procedures and more extensive procedures and analysis and analytics and things like that. They get more value out of that when we can actually translate that to meaningful insights and recommendations. So I do think, and, and again, I think it goes along with this evolution that we're seeing in terms of the, the form of disclosure, the avenue through which companies are providing this information, and really increasingly tapping back into this governance conversation, the confidence that, that the board and senior leadership want to have in, in the accuracy and, and reliability of this information and, and really wanting to make sure that they um, you know, are as confident as they can be in this information. So definitely there's two levels of assurance. We're seeing that the marketplace evolve, and there's value in, in both. There's just no sort of this is how it's done, right? We're, we, it, it's some it's sort of meeting the market where it is and meeting clients where they are. Yeah, and I'll add to that because I agree. We're seeing the same thing. And you know, when you move from uh, when, when we think about the evolution of reporting, you know, in the U.S., uh, let's say, and the stakeholders where this information was helpful to all sophisticated users. But there's been an emphasis, as we mentioned, over the past you know, 12 or 18 months with investors, as well as with purview from finance and the board and the audit committee. And though those particular subset of stakeholders um, are very familiar with the exam level of assurance, and they're very familiar with what the reports look like, the rigor of procedures behind the assurance and the confidence they can take in the data and what it means. So that, I think, is also helping drive this evolution. Um, I think it's important to remind our CPAs who are on the call um, and also inform um, you know, the corporates who are on the call is when seeking a level of assurance, um, you know, we often advise, you know, let's see what your controls and processes are. How automated are your systems around this? Let's see what could be done you know, at an exam level or a review level. Because if you select an exam level, and for some reason you can't get to exam level, under the standards you just can't revert and say, well, fine, we'll do review level. It's not how our standards work. So it's also often, you know, how, how we, um, when we talk to clients who are thinking about assurance for the first time, again, it's voluntary. So as Kristen mentioned, you can move through this kind of journey or process. For clients who are more mature and have those certain bodies uh, have a bigger, bigger hand in reporting that I mentioned, you know, audit committee, board, finance, um, and, and you know, they're you know usually in a better place to to be at the exam level of assurance. But again, it, it's this journey. Thanks, Kristen and John. Um, <clears throat> I do just want to encourage folks, if you have questions as we're going through this, please do, you know, please do submit those. Um, <clears throat> uh, and just a quick recap, so we, John referred to a number of resources earlier. We, we do have a slide on that and we will, and Mary will be sharing it after the, the, call, the call. So you'll, you will have access to all of those uh, documents that he referred to. Um, you know, we started talking a little bit about performing these engagements. And so maybe, you know, maybe Chris or John, I'll let whoever wants to start, start. So, Maybe you could just highlight some of the unique challenges that, that you face when trying to perform assurance of, of non-financial information or integrated reports. And maybe you could speak um, from, you know, challenges from a company perspective, as well as, you know, challenges from an assurance provider perspective. Yeah, maybe, Kristen, can you answer that question? Because I did have a comment come in <laughs> um, that, I'll, that I'll address now, and, I, and I'll respond to it, but I'll probably forget what the question was by the time I get done speaking. Um, <laughs> But sure. Paul, you bring up a good point. Um, you can, there's also a level of assurance called agreed upon procedures. And, and there are, it's a good way to get started with some clients. Um, agreed upon procedures are where um, 
the client comes up and agrees to procedures to be conducted by the CPA, um, whether it's recalculating, whether it's vouching, a certain amount of sampling, but they're very specific procedures where the CPA does not form a conclusion or opinion or issue an accountant's report. You issue an agreed upon procedures report. Um, it's a good way to, to start into to some of this assurance um, process. The agreed upon procedure reports aren't for general use. So they're either used with uh, selected um, parties, restricted parties, or they're used for management use only. But again, it helps management gain the value of going through some exercises to get input and get feedback um, and try to make improvements. So, so thanks, Paul, for, for that comment. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about preparing and a little bit more on the journey. I think in terms of challenges, you know, again, trying to keep that ultimate integrated reporting theme in mind, you know, we find that there's sort of three key um, challenges are just areas of focus to, to help a company think through their readiness and, and, and what assurance is going to mean. And, you know, it's, it's timing, sort of what is your disclosure objective as you think about moving more towards an integrated reporting model or at least alignment of financial and non-financial reporting. A lot of the challenges come in in terms of just the access, the timing, the availability of information in this space. And then that naturally leads into the comment John was making in terms of what's the data management process and, 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 and the governance around that, right? The roles and responsibilities, the competence of, of the, the, the people involved in generating and consolidating and, and you know, assembling that information um, in a manner that's presented in accordance with, with criteria. And just, you know, more broadly speaking, we're seeing just in terms of the, the overall disclosure practices, the disclosure protocols within an organization, the governance structure, a lot of this is, you know, as an organization, as we find, as, as we work with a number of companies, this form of reporting has evolved over many, many years. Sort of how sustainability is defined or ESG is defined for an organization, um, it continues to evolve. And naturally, the, the process for collecting the information, the, the, those responsible, um, you know, are, are you using, you know, spreadsheets or what mechanisms are you using to access and gather the information? It varies across many different parts of the organization. And I think that gets back to the point that John introduced is, again, this lens towards integrating um, this overall performance management and performance disclosure is, is this, this, you know, the, the silos within organizations have to be minimized to, to really introduce this collaboration and, and a centralization, the governance around um, what you're reporting, how you're reporting, who's responsible, and ultimately that there's, you know, a, an escalation process in terms of how this disclosure is ultimately um, assembled, reviewed, and, and approved for, for, for the ultimate disclosure. Um, I think that's applicable both to companies as well as assurance providers. You know, we know that in a lot of cases, companies struggle with their reporting process. And in a lot of cases, the reason companies, um, their reports are delayed into the summer months, if you're a calendar year end, is given the challenge with, you know, assembling and, 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 and the, the, the reporting process. And, and from a, from assurance provider perspective, there's an important role that assurance can play in helping to establish and, and stay very, uh, you know, focused on, on a clear timeline because of that third party <coughs> role in the process. And I think a lot of these issues are being further um, elevated and, and, and sort of surfaced as, as we see greater demand for more timely information. And I think it's just, you know, a function of this evolution. And, and I think we're, you know, companies are navigating through these challenges and naturally, again, assurance can be an important role to help um, minimize some of the challenges with timing systems and governance. Yeah, and I'll add to that, um, you know, what we've seen a shift in uh, and I've had clients, and again, this is kind of follows the market. Um, you know, years ago when the GRI had their standards out and it was an A, B or C based upon the volume of information you put out to drive transparency, you know, that's changed. So we have clients now who are only reporting on metrics that they view are material. We have clients because if it's a metric that they truly manage and it aligns with their strategy and their operations, then they're going to focus on it. So they're going to make sure they wrap the controls and processes around it and they're going to report on it. Um, we also have clients who are mature and say, we're not going to chase 
or respond to every survey that comes in the door. You know, our, our, any corporation can, can tell you how many hundreds of surveys they have as far as wanting ESG information. Hey, we saw your sustainability report, but we want your greenhouse gas emissions kind of tweaked like this, or can you calculate like this, or could you break it out by that? Um, and rather than doing that and devoting these FTEs to run around and just respond to surveys, you know, they've made their selection of how and where they're reporting and they're trying to make a market stance as far as how to put information out there. So one time out can be used many. Um, and I think that's a, a flaw in the overall marketplace currently that will hopefully eventually um, root itself out. Um, but I think there's also the timing issue from a decision making standpoint. Kristen made you know, the point that sometimes this stuff can drag on and it's often you know, where there's a lot of manual reporting, manual controls, manual data capture, um, and where folks have, you know, this is somewhere on their responsibility matrix. Hey, got to pull together the information and provide it to X, Y, Z, and they just do it after year end. Now, I, I don't think quarterly reporting on this information um, is needed, is needed at this point in time. I don't know if it, if it will become a thing ever, but managing and tracking the data as close as you can to real time will help at the end of the year because there is a push um, by more mature companies and by investors and others who want to know there's a push to actually have this information out in a similar time frame as you have your financial statements out because it actually is being used for decision making purposes so it's no good if it comes out you know if you have a year end client or if you're a year end company for it to come out in August or September you know they want it when they're evaluating everything all at once Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I could just add uh, perhaps another point in terms of, you know, we talked about challenge to preparers and challenge to assurance providers, but I think there's another dimension to challenge to investors, right, the user, well, an intended user of, of assurance in terms of enhancing the credibility and, and confidence in the trust in the information. And we know, I think just building on John's point, you know, we know investor scrutiny continues to increase around this information because it's viewed as so valuable. These are providing insights into how a company is managing potential disruptive trends, the impact that they're having on the environment or society or the dependence that they have on the environment and society and how that can translate to um, an, an interpretation of the long-term value creation potential. And so, you know, an investor wants to understand does your, does your disclosure align with these risks that, that, that you're determining apply to you or perhaps those that, that maybe others might think are do apply to you and, and that you're not communicating about? And how can assurance provide that enhanced confidence that not only does, does management have a mechanism in place to effectively understand on a, rate, on a continuous basis these potential implications, these impacts, but that they have the, the, the controls and the processes just like they do around other traditional operational measures or, or financial processes that, that drive that discipline and governance and visibility and prioritization and attention to these issues. So they, the user of the information has confidence that it has gone through this internal process and ultimately is presenting a fair picture of not only the current state of the business, but um, you know, how a company is navigating from a longer term, a term view. And, and maybe Desiree, I could go from there into to answering a couple of these questions that are coming in online. And I think I can wrap two of them together. There's one that says, uh, are external standards like SASB or GRI useful uh, in the assurance process? And then the one right after that is, what does assurance via accountancy profession do to move the needle on the big issues of our time? Does it have a meaningful role in addressing issues like inequality, greenhouse gas emissions, workplace issues, supply chain, et cetera, et cetera? You know, I think the, the reason why I say those go hand in hand is yes to both, right? So SASB and GRI set what we call suitable criteria. And under professional accounting standards, suitable criteria needs to be complete, measurable, objective, and relevant, and it needs to be publicly available. So that if Desiree and I and Kristen were all, all went into a separate room and read a sustainability report or a disclosure on a metric, we would come together to the same table and we would each have the exact same understanding of what is being reported, how, and we know we got apples to apples. So that's where SASB and GRI and other frameworks and standards are helpful. And those standards help to move the needle on the issues of our time, wrapping it into the second question, because the standards are set up, most of them, through a public uh, comment process. And if the particular metrics that are addressing the issues of our time in a 
way that sets how they should be measured and calculated and how they should be reported and presented. If those are truly the issues of our time, providing assurance over those allows a company and a user of the information to know that the information was collected, aggregated, reported, and presented in accordance with that criteria. So you're getting apples to apples, but having that assurance also allows the reader or the user of the information to know that it is accurate and reliable. So, you know, I hope that addresses those two questions. And Kristen, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to those two that were in there, because I see some more pouring in as well. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that, and and I think, you know, it's all kind of a, a virtuous cycle here with some of these questions we're getting in. It's just that assurance is again that 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 additional component of of driving rigor and and what do we all want from this reporting? What does the marketplace want? Is that reporting serves a purpose? Reporting serves to help drive performance. And so the higher quality, the more rigor established processes and management of these issues is going to influence um, the, from a bigger picture perspective these societal and environmental shifts. And so, again, we think, you know, assurance plays a critical role in, in driving and accelerating um, performance around, around these issues and, and trying to solve for these big challenges that we're dealing with. Thanks, Kristen and John. You know, and just kind of looking at some of these, uh, some other questions that are, you know, coming in here, Kristen, I don't know. So I might just pose them to, to you and John. So... <clears throat> that one of the questions is, you know, more and more investors are incorporating data from third-party providers, <clears throat> excuse me, such as MSCI in their process. Are these providers making any distinction between data that comes with assurance and data that doesn't? Do, do, you, do you know how they look at that? Well, I'll take a stab and, and definitely jump in. This is, this is one of the critical sort of market levers, right, that, that, that we're seeing drive, absent a broad regulatory mandate, drive, drive behavior. Maybe just stepping back, um, you know, MSCI is a critical influencer. I think the biggest challenge um, with the MSCI is just the, the information is, um, you know, what's available is used in, in, their, in their, their rating system. And, <laughs> you know, so our message to companies is, you know, if you don't tell your story, someone else will. And, and that's really... Um, the starting point. I think you know, you've got uh, data providers like a, a Bloomberg, less a rater, but more of a, a data provider where they're making it very transparent if a company, all the information they report on and if they obtain assurance and what is subject to assurance. And I think that's providing more visibility to the users of this information and an indicator as to you know the the reliance that they can they can place on this information. I think you know a number of uh, of these evaluators, when there is an opportunity for companies to engage with with the the data provider, the rater, and and provide some context, that that assurance is a is a consideration in in sort of the holistic assessment of of the the profile that these raters are creating about a company. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, again, the, the communication is, you know, driving effective communication around the, the areas of the ESG impacts and dependencies that are most important to you is the best way to communicate with the market and be appropriately evaluated because you're, you're more effectively controlling the evaluation. Now, that's sort of that's the aspiration and that's the, the ultimate objective. We still work with a number of, of clients who, who continue to remain frustrated with the what they they perceive as the lack of appropriate evaluation by these raters and rankers. But again, that tool that, that, that you have as a company to control the message, again, is reinforced through assurance and the confidence that that gives you and then gives the users of the information about the relevance and, and how meaningful this information is, is the best way to be appropriately evaluated. Yeah, I'll add it. You know, it's an imperfect system at this point. If we ask investors, hey, can you just tell all the companies what metrics to report on because that you're using in your models, that doesn't happen. And I'm not sure that'll happen anytime in the near future. And then you ask some of the raters, how are you doing it? And oftentimes those are black boxes or they're using information provided that's gathered by bots or otherwise and may not be accurate, may not be timely. It could, it's not necessarily from the sustainability report. Um, so there's a lot of imperfections. And I think you know, it's helpful and is helping to drive the market in the right direction and information is being used, um, but it's got a ways to go. And, you know, again, getting back to some examples of mature organizations, you know, some of them have said, we're going to put out what we want to put out and we're going to let the folks use what's out there. 
but we're going to spend our time focusing on what we need to manage and not chasing all these things down. Um, so I think that's, you know, there's a little bit of the market needing to lead. There's a little more clarity that needs to come from the ratings and rankers and, and there needs to be uh, clear, consistent asks of companies because they can't, you can't keep running around, you know, providing information. You know, some of them receive two or 300 requests a year for different types of data. You, you know, you figure that out how many that is a week and you're clearly not responding to all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe just building on that point, I know there's a couple questions here around um, materiality and what we're talking about in terms of reporting on what's relevant to the organization. And I think the, the key question that, that companies, you know, evaluate on a continuous basis is, and it's framed in this question is, you know, what's material to one stakeholder is not necessarily material to another. And, you know, I think that the emphasis, and I think GRI has done, you know, I mean, they, they serve as the, the, the standard that grounds materiality in terms of defining, you know, who your audience is, so an understanding of your stakeholders. So if your intended audience is investors, then that's what guides your consideration of what's material, right? What's, what's gonna be material of interest to an investor? But from a, a broader sustainability or ESG reporting standpoint, <coughs> an understanding of um, a, a, a universe of, of critical stakeholders needs to be evaluated in accordance with the principles that GRI states and an understanding of the areas of interest of, of all of those organizations and, and the purpose of a materiality assessment, which is why it's such an emphasis and, and so important to guide this form of reporting is because it, through a very transparent um, process, a company will describe, you know, who they defined as their critical stakeholders, right? Who's the intended audience of this communication? Um, what are the topics that are of interest to those stakeholders? And how did we as an organization, you know, translate that to the needs and, and the objectives of our business to draw a relative prioritization to say, hey, look, we could be focusing on 40 issues, but we've narrowed that down to 10 or, you know, whatever the number is that are most relevant in terms of driving our message and our performance story to be, to be meet, meeting the information needs of a universe of, of stakeholders that, that the company has defined. And there's always this, this recognition if you think about the matrix, which many of you are, are all very familiar with. And you know, the priority topics are what command the communication, you know, sort of the real estate of your, of your report. But it's not to say that some of these other topics that might not bubble up to the, the top quadrant or whatever form you use aren't important, right? But they're, they're, they are issues that you're, you're monitoring as a part of operating your business. Um, but, but there's got to be a mechanism to prioritize in, in alignment with the objective of a confine, con, concise, relevant, meaningful, but yet complete story about uh, the performance of a company that, again, evolves over time. So materiality is a, is a tricky one, especially as we move towards this whole concept of integrated reporting and, you know, really trying to be very clear about the audience and how that dictates and guides what disclosure you provide and then how you communicate that, right? What's the, the storyline around that to help the uh, user digest and, and interpret the information? Thanks, Kristen and John. You know, I just saw, I see, well, actually a few more questions coming in now. Um, <clears throat> Just scrolling up to one of them. So, you know, one of the questions is, you know, what are your observations about the state of collaboration between corporate finance and accounting with corporate sustainability responsibility teams? How are they getting together towards enterprise or integrated approaches? Yeah, so I can start with that one. And again, it's 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 at more mature organizations. I see it very heavy handed and in a, in a, in a well, maybe heavy handed is the wrong word to use. I see a very collaborative effort. Um, and, and if you just think about it, we say, all right, you've got sustainability information going out, whether it's in a sustainability report in some sort of uh, integrated annual slash sustainability report or just information on the website. Um, and then you say, well, okay, that's going out there. Investors are using it. So most companies at this point have investor relations in, in, involved in some level. And then, you know, well, S investor relations is very tied with SEC reporting and SEC reporting and the controllership and you know, you start to really bring those pieces together. So at mature organizations that are, that I see as a good example um, to set, you know, when we go in to do sustainability assurance, somebody from the finance function is involved all the way through. And it's not just because we're doing assurance. Somebody from the finance function is involved all the way through the process, even when we're not there. So when they're thinking, when they're going through their materiality assessments, when they're developing controls and processes, 
to actually pull the information together when they're figuring out where they're going to disclose what they're going to say in their report, how it relates to what they're saying in their quarterly filings and in their uh, 10Ks. So they're involved all the time. They sit in on the meetings. And, you know, at first it's, uh, it's a big learning curve, especially if, you, you know, you take somebody like when I started as a CPA, you take them right, you know, out of, you're not taken out, but you're adding to their roles and responsibilities, you know, this engagement with the sustainability function. Um, but they quickly come up to speed and they don't have to be an expert in every GRI metric. You know, if they know the basics of accounting and they know the basics of how the accountant disclose everything else from an SEC perspective, they're going to have their professional skepticism. They're going to have, you know, their questions that they ask and they're going to think about it from that mindset, which is the value add to the overall process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just add to that point in terms of, in particular, the the increased collaboration between finance and the more operational sustainability uh, teams. And, and clearly, legal is an important dimension, right? The corporate secretary is engaging with the board on a regular basis. And I know there's a question here around the role of the board. But, you know, if you step back and think about, you know, the... <coughs> <coughs> Right, as I was making my big point, right? <laughs> I'm starting to talk. Um, the, 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 the evolving role of a CFO, right, in terms of um, a steward and, and, a, and ultimately sort of a risk manager of, of the business and how, um, you know, the, the, the processes and the mechanisms to manage risk and, and drive value are established and, and consistent across the organization. So thinking through, you know, these risks and opportunities that I think we've got more definitional clarity around, right? The sustainability agenda is not this sort of side bolt-on sort of activity that's a feel-good exercise, that there's, I think, a broader appreciation that these, that what we're talking about is integral to how the business operates and, and how the company is going to continue to navigate and drive value into the future. And so when you position it in the context of the role of finance, in, in helping to, to add to the evaluation, the considerations, the prioritizations of those risks, and then how you put in place the systematic and disciplined processes and controls to manage those risks and then ultimately measure and, and communicate performance. There's such a, um, an intersection, an opportunity, again, in that mindset of, of, a, of, of a steward, stewardship role from, from the finance organization. And I think that lends itself very, um, clearly to to the role of the board and and the role that that the audit committee and and in many cases other committees but but really the role of the entire board in in their fiduciary role from a understanding you know what what could present a disruptor a disruptor to meeting the strategy what what are risks that are that are accelerating rapidly um, some risks you're monitoring on a longer term basis a, a climate change or you know some of these longer term but as you think about regulatory developments as, you know, the attention around plastics or, you know, some of these issues that can bubble and accelerate more rapidly, you know, having the board's, you know, context broad, be broadened en enough to understand, you know, how does that translate to what we're currently evaluating from an enterprise risk standpoint, but that we need to, you know, be adaptable and, and understand and sense how developments in the marketplace are of, you know, impacting us as an organization as well as how we are um, impacting uh, those around us so that, that we can try to minimize that volatility or, or potential disruption. But again, I think it's just a hand-in-hand -hand relationship, but it starts with being very clear and defining, you know, what are the ESG impacts and dependencies that are relevant to the business and how can that frame and prioritize um, the roles across all of those areas of the business. Yeah, and, and a way to think about it, you know, if your board and audit committee aren't involved, you, you're, you're missing the boat and you're exposing yourself to risk. Because if you think about, you know, big company, medium company, whatever, you think about commitments that are made publicly, whether you're a big company and you've signed on to um, different initiatives, whether it's with the UN or the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, or you've made some commitments in line um, with those, you know, you don't, companies don't do that without the proper authorization, right? So if you've made commitments and you're starting to track different things that impact these commitments, again, whether it's climate change risk or otherwise, um, if, if you don't have the board involved and there's no oversight and governance from the board and audit committee, then there's a, a definite disconnect in what you're saying and, 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 and purporting yourself out in the public domain. 
and then what's actually being ma managed and operated. And, and that's where you'll fall down and you'll have some exposure. Okay, thanks, Kristen and John. Um, just, I, I know we're kind of, we have about 10 minutes left and uh, my, my pose one or two questions to you and then kind of open up if, if others want to you know, ask questions out loud on the, on the call. Um, so maybe just, just anything, are there any future developments? What, you know, what, what are some of the future developments, I guess, that we can expect to see in this area of assurance of non-financial information? Anything that's coming down the, the line that folks should be aware of or just know that they exist? Well, I, oh, go ahead, Kristen. Kristen, I can't hear you. Can anybody else hear Kristen? No. Oh, Kristen, I unmute. Okay, sorry about that. No um, I, I, it was just a reinforcement of one of the points I made previously in terms of this greater emphasis and expectation on relevance and, and, and how meaningful your d disclosure to the investment community in particular <clears throat> and the expectation that an emphasis on, you know, the material uh, performance areas from an ESG perspective appropriately reflect the risk and the opportunities that, that are presented yes, from an ESG perspective that, that are presented to the business. And, and that expectation that, that, that an investor can be confident that, that the disclosure effectively addresses those risks and opportunities. The importance of assurance in, in building that trust and that confidence with, with investors who are going to use it to truly assign value to companies, whether however they're assembling sort of the data profile about a company is only going to become more important. And so I think starting down the process, I think one of the points um, that we were going to touch on a little bit was this idea of, and we talked about this journey, but, but there are steps that companies can begin to take. Um, we talked about AUPs versus attestation and even readiness, you know, undertaking a, a readiness assessment to really dig into your current process, understand where there are opportunities for improvement, where there may be gaps as you would, you know, aspire to or, or you know, establish an objective to obtain assurance by a certain date and be communicating that to your interested stakeholders. There are measures that, that, that companies can be taking now to, you know, first and foremost, immediately improve the efficiency of the reporting process, um, the impact of, of the management of these topics in terms of um, accelerating performance, and also, you know, again, strengthening that, that strength, the, the trust with, with critical stakeholders. So I, I just, it's an important area to, to really stay um, focused on because I think the, the expectation is only going to increase at, at a rapid pace. Yeah, and, and I would add, you know, we hear a lot more around the company's purpose. We hear a lot more um, concern from the C-suite about long-term value. We hear that from uh, the new workforces coming in, um, from appeasing customers to, and the customers of tomorrow. So a lot of goals and objectives are set around creating longer term value for the organization. And a lot of those goals are objectives that are ESG related, you know, have financial impact. A simple example is, you know, if someone, if many companies are looking to become carbon neutral and they're doing it through different mechanisms and sometimes it's, it's purchasing renewable energy credits. Um, but if you were calculating your greenhouse gas emissions and you decided to purchase Rex, um, but you weren't doing it thoroughly and you were over counting or under counting, um, you know, you have an expense item associated with it, but then at the same point in time, you're putting information out there publicly saying you are or aren't something and you haven't gone through the rigor of actually having a CPA look at that to, to actually help you make better decisions, make sure you're only spending enough on, on Rex, the appropriate amount, but also that your claims are valid. And, you know, those claims out there like renewable energy or, or carbon neutral um, are important to a host, you know, not just investors, but to a broader base of stakeholders. Thanks, John. <clears throat> um, I'm just trying to take a quick look through the through some of the new questions coming in. Uh, thanks to also thanks for for somebody for pointing out that the the IWSB has a um, so they're in the process of developing assurance guided for guidance for extended what they're calling extended external reporting. Um, they have a draft a consultation paper out. So for anyone who wants to comment that that is out until uh, the 20th of June, and then they are hoping to publish that. Um, an exposure draft early 2020 and is uh, followed by the final publication hoping for by the end of um, 
at the end of 2020. So just, I do see an interesting question here about uh, non-financial information subject to assurance process. Will it ever be absorbed into the financial audit process? I would like to say that would be great, and that's where it should go. I may be um, on the beach somewhere sipping margaritas by the time that happens. Um, <laughs> you know, there's as we talked about, there's different levels of assurance. Um, there's different subject matter for assurance, and in particular, you know, if you're a large public company, you're under you know different SEC reporting guidelines. So, you know, there needs to, there's bigger movement that needs to be made in the marketplace to actually get to that level, which, you know, I, I think we should get to. However, as of today, um, if you use your financial statement auditor to do your non-financial assurance, there are often times where there are efficiencies gained. Um, you know, if information for non-financial metrics is coming from systems that are tested and relied on from a control testing perspective by your auditor, you can pull the information out of there and do less testing on it. If there's a P&L item that um, is already tested because it's material under your financial statement audit, and it actually is a driver for one of your non-financial metrics, say an expense that is associated with GHG emissions, you know you have already tested or could do less testing on that particular driver in order to test this non-financial metrics. It doesn't always happen one-to-one. -one. It's not a perfect system, but there are opportunities for um, efficiencies. Yeah, and I would just add one point to that in terms of the that, that intersection in terms of non-financial and, and financial assurance audit is, you know, as a financial statement auditor, you know, we need to, to have an understanding of these ESG uh, developments that are relevant to the business just from a risk assessment perspective as, as we define our, our audit plan for, for the financial statements because you know as companies communicate about the risks that are relevant and, and, and the considerations around that these are just critical to understanding the, the, the business and, and, and how it, the business is navigating through um, changing changing trends. So as John said there there are tactical and, and in the current practice we do see efficiencies and again, we just bring a perspective of understanding the organization, but, but it is important, even just standalone financial statement audit, if there's, there's an understanding of these issues and how we're thinking about risk and, and opportunity. Great, thanks, Kristen and John. Um, you know, so I think we've only got two minutes left here, so I might just ask if you have any sort of final quick closing comments for the group uh, kind of before we wrap up. We have tried our best to get to all the questions. I think we might have missed a few, but we did try our best. Um, so any closing thoughts just for the group? Yeah, I just have a quick thank you and thanks for the interest in all the questions and we'll, we'll definitely digest these questions and um, we'd love to continue this conversation. I think my main theme is um, looking at, at, at assurance in this whole evolving space instead of as just an added expense or burden as it's really a tool to drive value, to drive efficiency, to drive um, you know, more effective and, and accelerated performance in these areas. So it's, it's, it's a real opportunity. And I'll add to that, you know, thank you as well. And you know, check out the AICPA resources, but it also takes all of us to drive this change. So if we don't like wasting our time completing all these surveys, you know, you know accountants can do a little bit, but, but also the marketplace can set some examples in this voluntary world we're in. So if you see something that'd be a leading practice or you wanna collaborate with, you know, with other peer or like-minded companies to actually push initiatives without creating anything new, just take what's out there and figure out what may be important and push that to simplify your life as far as reporting goes. Um, I think sometimes it's just gonna take the marketplace to kind of eliminate the noise 